Are you sure? Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never ask a bride why she's getting married. Don't wear a skirt on a windy day. Deodorant is not a shower. Don't sniff chili flakes. <laughs> and don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. For some time now, say for about three, four years, I think I'd say four to five years, we've seen the rise of a new phenomenon in Indian politics called bulldozer justice. It's also frightfully popular. Popular, obviously, among supporters of a particular party, in this case, the BJP. But the fact is that the idea has so much oomph that others have also tried to copy it. So other chief ministers in other states, not that many, but in some cases have tried to do this because the idea caught on. However, just now, the Supreme Court this week has given an order which, for all practical purposes, has finished this idea. So first of all, Every once in a while, our Supreme Court, you know, it faces a lot of criticism. Individual judges face, face a lot of criticism. The judgments come under criticism. All that's fair. All that's fair and healthy. That is how it should be in a robust democracy. But also, the same Supreme Court, quite often or every once in a while, which is not that rare, every once in a while, delivers some judgment that you can celebrate, that you can talk about. And this judgment, particularly written by Justice B.R. Gawai for himself and Justice K.B. Vishwanathan, his brother judge on the same bench, it's a two-judge bench, this, just, this judgment also deserves to be celebrated for its clarity, for its clarity and brevity. A 95-page judgment in large type with double spacing is actually a very short, very brief judgment by the standards of the Indian Supreme Court. And you know, shorter is always clearer or often clearer unless it's a cop-out, which it, which this judgment is not. This is a very clear judgment on, on a bunch of ideas. And I will come to those ideas, but I will tell you first of all, how does Justice Gawai set it up? And I might add a couple of things of my own to that, which some of you, at least those who like Hindi film music, uh, may, may appreciate. So he starts, he starts with lines from Kavi Pradeep. Now, Kavi Pradeep is famous to for my generation, generation maybe before mine, my parents' generation, our children's generation onwards and will probably always be famous for something that he wrote and something that Lata Mangeshkar sang that brought tears to Nehru's eyes. That is, after the Chinese, Chinese war, after the debacle in the Chinese war. He is also famous for something else that he wrote in the 40s that the British banned belatedly, that is, Dur Hato Hai, Duniya Walo, Hindustan Hamara Hai, Aaj Himale Ki Choti Se, Phir Ham Nei Lalkara Hai. So he's written poetry like that. So, so it's from one of his poetries that Justice Gawai has picked up the lines and started this judgment. And these lines are, Apna ghar ho, apna angan, is fab mein har koi jeeta hai, insaan ki dil ki ye chahat hai, ke, ek, ke ghar ka sapna na chute. And then he translates it in English as well. To have one's home, one's own backyard. This dream lives in every heart. It's a longing that never fades to never lose the dream of a home. Now I saw some discussion uh, on social media that maybe he could have picked up something more popular or something more contemporary. A couple of things that I can mention, a couple of things that have been mentioned in these discussions also. One is... Ek Bangla Bane Nyara. Now that was way before my times. 1938, the film, as I told you, was president. Must have been one of the early movies with sound. Just after the silent era movies. So, mu lyricist in this case was Kedar Sharma. The composer was R.C. Boral. And this goes, Ek Bangla Bane Nyara, Rahe Kunba Usme Sara, Sone Ka Bangla, Chandan Ka Jangla, and so on. And you know what? For our generation... We became familiar with this song later in 1969 in Raj Khosla's super, super hit Do Raste with Rajesh Khanna and Mumtaz. This song is played again in that case by the family patriarch, in, which, in this case the older brother of Rajesh Khanna played by Balraj Sahani who sits in his home playing this song 
on a 78 RPM on an old generation gramophone player with a 78 RPM record because his dream is also to build a house for himself. And then if you go forward, house has been very much a part of popular culture and aspiration, social aspiration, family aspiration, 1977. Gulzar's film, Ghoronda, Gulzar's words also, Do Diwane Sheher Mein, Raat Mein Ya Do Peher Mein, Aabodana Dhoondte Hain, Ek Aashiyana Dhoondte Hain. And this is about a young couple who are getting married, who put up money to buy a flat in Bombay, and then the builder dupes them and disappears, and they don't know what to do. So once again, the story is built around, around a house. Those words were written by Gulzar and the composer is Jaydev in that, that case. In fairness, I should mention everybody and the voice in that song is very interesting. The voice voices in that song are Bhupender, the great ghazal singer. He sang very often for Gulzar and also Runa Lela, Bangladeshi singer who came into India, sang a few great songs and then went back to Bangladesh. Unfortunately, I wish she had stayed on. So house is part of the essential part of the Indian family dream because most families work all their lives to be able to save money to build that one house. And when that gets demolished, once again, I will read a para from the judgment to give you an idea of how the judges, judges describe this phenomenon of bulldozer justice. Now, bulldozer justice is not an expression, exact expression that these judges have used. This was used in a November 10 order by Justice D.Y. Chandrachud in another case. Now they say, these judges say, and this is para 72, the beautiful thing about this judgment is almost everything is para marked and you can reach the para, not just pages, the para. So para 72, the chilling sight of a bulldozer demolishing a building when authorities have failed to follow the basic principles of natural justice and have acted without adhering to the principles of due process reminds one of a lawless state of affairs where might was right. So, so many met important metaphors there, which is violation of natural justice without adhering to basic principles of due process, lawless state of affairs, might is right, etc., etc. And then they go on to say in the same para, in our constitution, which rests on the foundation of the rule of law, such high-handed and arbitrary actions have no place. Such excesses at the hands of the executive will have to be dealt with by the heavy hand of the law. Our constitutional ethos and values would not permit any such abuse of power and such misadventures cannot be tolerated by the, by the court of law. That is how they set up this judgment. This judgment is rooted in this para. Now, if we go over this judgment, see this page. In fact, the judges tell us what principle is dealt with in which Para. That makes it much easier. So you can see that and you can go over the judgment. I'll share a link with you. Please do that if you are interested. So number one is rule of law. Number two, separation of powers. That's between the executive and judiciary. Number three is doctrine of public trust and public accountability. Number four, rights of the accused under the constitution. Number five, principles of criminal justice presumption of innocence and natural justice. Number six, right to shelter as part of right to life. And number seven, permissibility of collective punishment. Because what happens when you say that oh, somebody has committed a crime, right? I'm going to punish the person. So first of all, you don't go through due process of proving a person's guilt in a court of law. But then you say, I will punish the entire family or the entire community. I'll demolish the house or I'll demolish every house in this street or mohalla. That's what had happened on 17th of April 2022 in Jahangir Puri in Eastern Delhi. That, some of you might remember, was the day of Hanuman Jayanti. There was a procession. There was some kind of a of maramari, some dakamukki, maybe some bit of riot, uh, rioting, following which a bunch of properties had been demolished. Again, the reasoning given was that these were unauthorized or these were encroachments, but no due process was followed. In that case, Maulana Mahmood Madni, who is a very familiar face in our media, he went to Supreme Court. There were also a bunch of other petitions. All of these were batched together. So this order has come out as a result of those. Now, what is it that the judges are saying? 
We'll talk about this in a little bit of detail and after that I will switch to something else that's happened, another very important thing that is a new research report on how India and China compared to each other have developed their human resources through their education from 1900 to 2020 and as we talk about that I will also have our correspondent who covers education, Fariha Iftikhar join us to explain that. First of all, what is it that the judges are saying? I read that para for you, where they, where they questioned the whole idea of bulldozer justice. Then they say, this is one more para from the judgment. It is, and I quote, it is not happy to see women, old people, children dragged to the street overnight. Heavens will not fall on the authorities if they hold their hands for some period. As itni bhi kya jaldi hai. You can wait. But then, when after they say you can wait, then they set up principles. Now, why has this happened? I told you about the Jang Jangir Puri case. This started actually in Uttar Pradesh. It started with Yogi Adityanath government. He had said, in fact, in 2017, September 2017, that if anyone ever thinks of perpetrating crimes against women in weaker sections, I will bulldoze their houses. So the idea came up then, but the first bulldozers were seen in action not until about three years after that. They started in around 2020. Even after the CAA uh, protest, there were notices issued for demolitions, etc. And that's when this momentum was building up. And then many demolitions were carried out. In fact, the first major demolitions were carried out against a Hindu family. This was, the, this was when the police in Kanpur had gone to catch Vikas Dubey, the gangster, and they were fired at and eight cops were killed. Vikas Dubey was killed later in an encounter or as they say was encountered later. But this was July 2020. After this, the house and the set of houses were, were demolished. That was the first big visible bulldozer action. Then the properties of gangsters Mukhtar Ansari in Mao of his family members, then Atik Ahmed in Prayagraj or what used to be Allahabad. Th those demolitions were carried out and all of that acquired this great popular appeal and Yogi Adityanath came to be known as Bulldozer Baba, right? He would go to other states also and pre people will bring in bulldozers in celebration of his coming into campaign. and. He himself in his campaign in the assembly elections made bulldozer an issue. Bulldozer became a kind of an unspoken election symbol of the party for a long time. Then others also took the cue from it. Ashok Gehloth in Rajasthan used it. He used it against the properties, again called illegally built properties, of two of the accused in a in a exam paper leak case. This was Rajasthan eligibility exam, exam for teachers training. There they said we are only demolishing illegal portions but the cause for action was immediately after this paper leak case. Shivraj Singh Chauhan in Madhya Pradesh used the bulldozer quite freely. April 2022 was the most visible and the most publicized use of the bulldozer by Shivraj Singh Chauhan in Madhya Pradesh. That was as Khargon. Again after Again, after rioting during the Ram Navmi procession, 16 houses and 29 shops were demolished. So these are, these are the more well-known bulldozer actions. These are the ones that the judges have now responded to. So what have the judges said? I gave you the seven sections on which they have argued their own judgment. First of all, the rule of law. That rule of law should be followed. There is a principle of natural justice. That cannot be denied to anybody. You cannot take arbitrary action, which means anybody against whom you take action has to have the right to reply, a fair right to be heard. Then you have to give a reasoning as to why you hold the person guilty in this case of a construction being unauthorized. Number two, separation of power. So they are saying that, look, under no circumstances can the executive, it can be a district magistrate, it can be a cop, it can, be, it can be a municipal corporation, anybody. They are all part of the executive. Under no circumstances, under our constitution, can the executive assume the powers of the judiciary. So they can't pronounce somebody guilty and carry out and deliver the punishment as well. Number three, doctrine of public trust and public accountability. That, you know, if governments start acting so arbitrarily without telling anybody, then public 
trust will get eroded and who will you hold accountable in case injustice was done when hundreds of officials come and bulldozers come and this action is carried out. I am obviously paraphrasing everything. Then right of the accused under the constitution. So innocent until proven guilty. That principle must be established. That principle must be honored. So the accused must be given the chance to defend themselves. Then principles of criminal justice which is the presumption of innocence and natural justice. I talked about that just a minute back. But you have to presume that a person is innocent until proven guilty. That applies to almost every law in the country, barring some really rare laws like, like UAPA, NDPS, PMLA. Those are rare exceptions. Otherwise, the principle of natural justice says innocent until proven guilty. And then they say Article 21 of the Constitution, right to life. And they position the right to shelter, the right to a house, inside the right to life and thereby in the fundamental right to life. And they say you can't just take it away like that. And then the permissibility of collective punishment. That, that for the guilt of one, can you punish, can you punish many people? Para 87, 88, 89. These are the key paras. You will see them on your screen also. Para 87, they say, and I'm only doing an abridged reading. The right to life is a fundamental right and right to shelter is a part of that. And these are under Article 21 of the Constitution. And they say, for the sake of punishing one res resident, you cannot punish the entire family or entire locality. Para 88, they say, and I quote, it will amount to inflicting collective punishment on the entire family or the families residing in the structure. Our constitutional scheme and the criminal jurisprudence would never permit the same. And then in Para 89, they quote from, from an order from Justice Krishna. I remember we talked about him just the other day on the Supreme Court's order on the, on the right to property. Justice Krishna Iyer said, we have rejected as a nation the theory of community guilt and collective punishment and instead no man shall be punished except for the, his own guilt. And he says blanket punishment, he uses the expression attainder. Now I know, now I know that Justice Krishna Iyer, even when an easy word was available, he will pick up the thesaurus and find a more difficult one. Uh, to you. So he says attainder, A T A T A I N A A T A I N D E R. I don't see it used in a normal, a normal English usage. So I'd say blanket punishment of a bulk of citizens on any vicarious theory for the gross sins of some only is easy to apply but obnoxious in principle. And this is a 1980 Krishna Iyer judgment and which contain precise instructions on how to carry out a demolition or how to even approach the idea of a demolition. So first of all, sufficient time for appeal to be given to the, to the likely victim or, the, or to the likely target. If the person does not want to make an appeal, time still should be given to them and the family, 15 days at least to organize their affairs, to move their stuff. So bulldozers don't come suddenly. Number two, a 15 days show cause notice has to be given. It has to be sent by registered AD, also pasted outside the property, which is marked designated to be demolished. Not just that, that is not enough because the court is worried that people can backdate their orders. And that's happened in a couple of cases when I think it happened in Prayagraj when demolitions were carried out and some, some demolition orders were produced. Of a, of a previous day. So the suspicion then was that these were backdated. So, so to avoid that, they've said that at the same time, you have to digitally send a copy of this order, the show cause notice or the order or, or, the, or the demolition order to the district magistrate's office, which must be auto confirmed digitally. So, you know, you have the timestamp and you cannot backdate anything. This notice should have the grounds on which this demolition is being planned and the district magistrate has to then send out emails to all authorities involved saying that this demolition might take place within the next month. Before that, however, the authority that wants to demolish has to serve grounds on the, on the person the date of hearing, the so person has to be given a personal hearing and after the personal hearing and after the personal hearing, the authority has to give a reason order explaining 
if they still want to carry out a demolition, explaining why they are rejecting the person's defense and also explaining why this offense cannot be compounded. Compounded means when you can pay a fine or do something and, and avoid demolition. So you just can't say this is not compoundable. You have to explain in writing. All these orders have to be put on the municipal or local authorities portal within three months. Once again, the authority has to explain why it's not good enough even if all other conditions are fulfilled. Why is it not enough to demolish just a part of the structure but the whole house? If even now the resident says that, look, I will carry out the demolition myself or I will carry out the rectification in my structure myself, that 15 days time has to be given. In any case, if there is to be a demolition, an inspection has to be carried out, an inspection report has to be written in the presence of two panchas, which means two neutral people, and the act of demolition has to be videographed. It has to be fully videographed. Videos have to be preserved and names of police and civil officials present have also to be recorded and these must be forwarded to the municipal commissioner who will then put them on his website, on, on his portal. Any violation of this will invite contempt and also prosecution and I quote now from the judgment because this is a very important line. And I quote, officers slash officers will be held responsible for the restitution of the, of the demolished property at his slash their personal cost in addition to payment of damages. And, and they'll be held accountable, obviously, in this case, by the Supreme Court itself. So this is the big sizable order. What this means is that at least now, if you follow this order, you cannot carry out any illegal demolition. In fact, even demolition of other unauthorized structures or squatters will now have to go through a very detailed process which will be recorded at all these levels including on video. Now you might ask me under which law have the, have the judges taken this action. So there, is a, so there is an article in our constitution precisely for situations like this. That is article 142 of the constitution where the Supreme Court can use its special powers under the article to deliver complete justice, total justice. This article is, is to be used mostly, mostly to give justice to the hapless citizen, which is what's been done, done in this case. Sometimes we've questioned the use of this article. A and we know that Indian cricket did not, did not particularly benefit from that. A lot of retired people, retired civil servants, ret ret retired civil servants, retired judges, including one retired general, they all benefited from that judicial misadventure. So Article 142 has been used somewhat lightly in a case like that. But in a case like this, when this article is used, then you can say that this is what the framers of the Constitution wanted when they wrote this particular article in, in our Constitution. Which brings us to the second part of this episode of Karta Clutter, as I, as I told you, and my colleague Fariha Iftikhar has joined us. Fariha covers education for us. And this is based on this landmark new study comparing the routes or paths that India and China have taken between 1900 and 2020 in the choices they have made over educating their people. The study is called The Making of China and India in the 21st Century, Long Run Human Capital Accumulation from 1900 to 2020. And this has been published on the economy blog Marginal Revolution written by this study has been done by Nitin Kumar Bharti and Lee Yang for Paris School of Economics's World Inequality Lab that by the way is associated with Thomas Piketty who's who's a well-known name now now what is the basic what is the basic argument the basic argument is that over 120 years India paid more attention to humanities education so India produced millions of BAs and MAs, right? Whereas the Chinese focused on vocational training, engineering, STEM, medicine, etc. So the Chinese in the course of time produced more employable people and because they produced more employable people, their economy also became more, became richer, their manufacturing grew because 
human resources were available for all of that in india too many people came out of colleges with these degrees that got them almost nothing so i will since this is also a day when we are talking about some music so i will give you two examples from two different eras what it tells you is that what these authors are saying is not something that's been unknown to popular culture in india so 1962 go right back 62 years 1962 there was a film called anpad anpad means illiterate with bina kumari in it and it had great songs written by raja mehdi ali khan so aapki nazron ne samjha pyar ke kabil mujhe but it had another one which has endured and which is very often quoted it's part of our popular language now that that metaphor is used very often in many debates and discussions and that is sekandar ne poras se ki thi ladai jo ki thi ladai to main kya karu कौरव ने पांडव से की हाथा पाई जो की हाथा पाई तो मैं क्या करूं दैट्स मॉकिंग द टीचिंग ऑफ हिस्ट्री सेइंग इफ सिकंदर फॉट विद पोरस हाउ डज इट मैटर टू मी इफ कौरव एंड पांडव फॉट हाउ डज इट मैटर टू मी दैट आई एम बीइंग टॉट ऑल ऑफ दिस बाय रोड एंड इट्स ऑफ नो यूज टू मी एंड देन इट गोज ऑन टू से एंड दैट्स अ टेलिंग लाइन इट गोज ऑन टू से ये बीए है लेकिन चलाए है ठेला that this guy has got a ba degree but he is basically pushing a hand cart ye ma hai lekin ye beche karela so karela is bitter god karela is karela everybody knows karela uh, everybody knows karela but i have to translate it because everybody doesn't know hindi that's a wrong presumption to make everybody also doesn't like karela but ye ba hai ye ba hai lekin chalaye ye thela that he's got a ba but he's driving a hand cart and this guy has had, ha, ha, and this guy has an ma has a masters degree but he's selling vegetables on the street so popular culture the poet knew in 1962 that these degrees are useless they don't get you the jobs in 1971 came gulzar's mere apne which is one of my favorite movies obviously gulzar wrote the lyrics there and that again had a line ba kiya hai ma kiya lagta hai wo bhi ma kiya kaam nahi hai warna yahan aapki dua se kafi theek thaak hai so what popular culture has known for 60 plus years is something that indian state and our education bureaucracies have persisted with and you have the situation now when you have this armies of ba means nothing armies of MAs armies of PhDs and so many of them lining up many of them many of your security guards in your gated colonies will be highly qualified on this metric and many others would just be hanging out mukherji nagar and equivalent places in other cities just hoping to crack upsc some day and we know what are the odds there of anybody doing that now having said that i now bring in fariha fariha explain the highlights and the graphics that you've used in your story will also share a link to her story so here sir the research paper has highlighted three differences when it actually takes us through the long run education journey and education approach of both india and china first it's it is talking about the bottom up and top down approach and i will explain it first so according to the research paper china initially focused on pre primary and primary level mass education like educating children in masse it is before communism and when com under communism between 1960s and 1980s the emphasis shifted to upper primary and secondary education and later 1980s onwards slowly steadily it started focusing on higher education so that is how the gross enrollment ratio which means the number of students in schooling age enrolled in schools have increased in china while in india under the influence of british rule uh india first started focusing on secondary level because they were serving like certain uh, you can say the they, we had to produce clerks yeah yeah and then after like uh, post colonization india started focusing on like forming colleges and specialized colleges tertiary education like iits yes. big medical institutions yes. yeah and after uh, post 1990s we can say post liberalization then india starting mass uh, primary education so what happened here the study highlights here due to this uh, change of course and the difference in the approach in 1970 cohort here cohort means the again the age group which is supposed to be in school the india was still india still had 37% illiteracy while in the same cohort china completely eradicated illiteracy 
So this is the first thing. Second, the uh, research focuses. And, and much of today's, a lot of today's generation are children of that 37% illiterate cohort. So while the children may have got education, but their parents were illiterate, illiterate. and that has Correct. consequences. Correct. Yes. Second was quality versus quantity. So here the study says that the initial expansion years of China's education system, they first focus on quantity, like enrolling more and more students in schools. And then after that, they focused, started focusing on teacher training, student teacher ratios and producing more specialized schools and all. Okay. Whereas in India, it was opposite. Like under British Raj, we started first focusing on like having uh, the emphasis was more on training teachers, giving more wages to teachers and not enrolling more and more students. So that also impacted our gross enrollment ratio. That is the second thing. Third, which is like you just mentioned and which is like most striking feature of this study is diversification of education. So here the study highlights then in pre 1950s, China started vocational education, which was highly actually linked to the industrialization and the military needs at that time in China. And also during the last imperial dynasty in China, specialized college for vocational education started establishing. It was like really early. And in, in fact, 1932, China had come up with a vocational education law, which formalized vocational education in colleges like higher education, tertiary education. Whereas in India, at the same time, we lagged behind because under British Raj, we were already lagging in terms of industrialization. The needs were very different at that time. So India started like vocational education or we can say skill education in normal terms very late. And here, like very interesting thing, which the uh, study highlights that how historically China had actually placed great emphasis on engineering education. So the paper highlights how historically China focused on engineering education, like it was the need of industry revolution there, industrialization there. And how we can, we'll give you an example in 1940s. 20% of graduates in China were engineers, while at the same time in India, the figure was just 3%. So like huge difference. And under colonial administration, India particularly focus on humanities. So I'll give you an example here. Like in until 2000, 80% of graduates in India were from humanities. So this somehow created a lot of imbalance and inequality in both the country when it comes to employability and in economic growth of both the countries. Because of course the skill skilling help in uh, improving the productivity of the population in both the countries. So these three striking features have been elaborately and nicely described in this paper. So while China kept, kept on growing and these engineers kept on or engineers or technically qualified people yeah. or vocationally trained people kept on filling that industry and this manufacturing boom came. In India, it was again BA kiya hai, yeah. hai thela. MA kiya hai to beche karela. That phenomenon continued. And not just engineering, China also at the same time started focusing on medical education. Also education itself. Yes, correct. Te teaching of train, uh, uh, training of teachers. Yes. So in 2010, I will give you an example here. Like China's graduation rate was 50% higher than India. But when it comes to medical in, uh, graduates, it was 250% higher than India. So it's like very recent, 2010. Yeah. Huge difference between so two, them. Th two things I've learned, two new acronyms. GER, which is Gross Enrollment, Enrollment rate, rate, and GGR, the Gross Graduation, graduation Rate. rate. Yeah. So on that note, will you explain these graphics that you've used in your uh, story? And graphics will be on your screen. Yeah, first of all, the graphic shows vocational enrollment share at secondary and tertiary stage. Starting from 1930s, like where our voca vocational education percentage was really low, like around 15% or even less than that, China's reached to 30% and even like more in tertiary level in 1980s, it's just to 50% almost, which is like a huge number, like 50% of your graduate students are uh, pursuing vocational education. Like some sort of skill they were learning at that time. Yeah, and I noticed that 1970, the Chinese have collapsed, but I suspect that's that, that's generally coinciding with the cultural revolution. Cultural revolution, cultural the, revolution. The, the, the study mentioned yeah. that. And then they, then they pick up, whereas India is at the bottom. Remember, when you see these graphics, the line in blue is India, the line in red is China. Is China. 
and and this also applies to tertiary education same yes same, similar same. trend yeah so next graphic next graphic is on total enrollment when we were just talking about like uh, top down and bottom up approach how china's emphasis on first enrolling student in masse has helped it achieving higher enrollment gross enrollment like if we see in 1980 china's higher uh, gross enrollment was 146 million while well, it was 74 million for india half of china yes and in 2020 india's gross enrollment ratio increased to 122 million while china's was 107 million and it should be attributed to reduction in the uh, young population in china so how did this happen that's because chinese followed the one child po child policy so th the number of younger people came down that's how china's uh, average age mean age has now gone up and they are worried whereas india kept on producing more babies so by this time india because sarv shiksha abhiyan came in the 90s yeah. by this time india was sending almost everybody to school so india had more young people in school now than in china the second part of the graphic shows net enrollment ratio it it uh, net enrol enrollment ratio is defined as the number of students in that age group which are enrolled in school like school going age group so for example in 1980 china's net enrollment ratio was 93% so 93% children in school going age were enrolled for india it was 69% and 2020 china achieved 100% ner whereas india stands at 93 yeah so, but india is getting there and now the final uh, final graphics which yeah. tell you which tell you the outcome of all of this राइट उसका सबका जूस निकाल के वो बताता है सो द फाइनल ग्राफिक शेयर शोज द शेयर ऑफ ग्रेजुएट्स डिसिप्लिन वाइज एंड इट शोज हाउ डाइवर्स चाइनाज लाइक कोहोट ऑफ ग्रेजुएटिंग स्टूडेंट्स देन इंडियाज लाइक मेजोरिटी यू कैन से लाइक एटी परसेंट ऑफ इंडियाज ग्रेजुएट्स इन टू थाउजेंड एंड टेन वर फ्रॉम ह्यूमैनिटीज यू सी दंक चंक ऑन योर चार्ट ऑल्सो एक्सप्लेन द कलर या सो ब्लू स्टैंड फॉर ह्यूमैनिटीज orange is for any other general education gray is for sciences and yellow is for engineering and uh, you can see one blue again dark blue which is only appeared in china's one which is medical because they have significant number of graduates in medical education that's why it is just there so it clearly shows that how the major pool of india's graduate still are under humanities education while in china it is much more diverse they are learning different skill even agriculture engineering medical and what not so that is how the change is there the difference is there so that's a very significant study for you thank you very much for explaining this for us and making it so much simpler but you know you can also see the outcome of this so i can go back to ba kiya hai ma kiya lagta hai sab kuch wo bhi ma kiya and you see you see that in this tens of thousands of people going the donkey route to canada the us etc doing really low value jobs there at the same time a lot of the indian industry particularly manufacturing industry is short of human resources so that is the paradox that needs to be addressed